Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live at Calvary Church in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media or to tune into our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Now here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 43 as we start a new chapter. Genesis chapter 43. And I've entitled our Bible study, Brought to Your Knees. Anybody among us ever been brought to their knees? You know, it's a painful, usually a very painful situation uh, that brings us to our knees. Uh, those of us that are parents, I heard someone say recently, actually, within the last year, that I thought was so, so profound that, you know, it's, uh, to parents in general, uh, some brother shared that the, in families, there's almost always one child that will bring you to your knees. And we've certainly experienced that uh, in our own life. And it doesn't always have to be like a prodigal, although I know uh, this last weekend, uh, through the ministry of Pastor Josh and the teaching that, that, that resurfaced the pain of prodigal living among kids or among parents or grandparents. Very sorry, it's a very hard road, but the Lord's gonna get you through it. He's gonna establish strength in you. Being brought to our knees is painful. And sometimes it's external, sometimes it's our own doing. In our last study together, we learned of the spiritual truth that your sin will find you out. That'll certainly bring you to your knees, that our sin would find us out. It's not that God is chasing you, no. But sin and its consequences will not stay hidden forever. We were reminded of Numbers. In Numbers chapter 32 and verse 23, the Bible says, but, be, but if you do not do so, then take note. You have sinned against the Lord and be sure that your sin will find you out. There is no such thing as a secret sin. Everything the Bible says is naked and revealed before him with whom we have to do. In the old King James. Now, it's true you might be able to hide it from someone for a while. You might be able to uh, cover it up from those that are close to you. But it's not really hidden. It will come to light. You can't hide it from God. And eventually he'll bring it to pass. Moses, he's speaking out of personal experience. He had sinned in killing the Egyptian here in Numbers and tried to bury the evidence, but he was caught. It's an example for us to be sure that our sins will find you out. It'll bring you to your knees. Listen, today here in the 21st century, the Lord would have us to know that your sin will find you out. My hands will be clean, as it has in many other studies, but for those today, my hands are clean before you, that I have faithfully warned you that your sin will find you out. And for some, that's very specific. That, that is a word from the Lord today in this moment. It, you will not be able to get away with it. Sin has a way of burying deep pain and consequences in your conscience. And it stays there. Sin will find you out in your conscience because your conscience just won't let it go. You've planted something there that can't be erased. Sin will find you out in your face. In your face, you go, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Well, purity marks a person's face, and so does impurity. It's evidence, it's seen. Emptiness and hardships mark a person's face. And you can see how sin has affected people's lives by just looking at their countenance. God can give special discernment as someone carrying around something where you, you just see it in their face. It, it causes you to ask, are you okay? And then that typical response, I'm fine, I'm fine. You can be sure that your sin will find you out. I can be sure that my sin would find me out if I chose to somehow hide it, play games with it. In time, it'll show all over your face. The Bible even speaks about a forward countenance, a forward face, a recognizable even though using old King James language, it really just means to be recognized and seen. Ultimately, sin will find you out, if not now, later. Because when you stand before God, 
There will be no hiding of anything you've done. In Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. An accurate account is being kept of your life. Everything you've done. And I thank God that there is a beautiful blotter that can blot out everything that's in that book. It's the precious blood of Jesus Christ. He can forgive you of all of your sins and cleanse a woman and cleanse a man of all sin so that when the books are open, I find my name in the book of life because of what Jesus has done for me. Not because I've tried to take things into my own, not because I think I'm smarter than God, not because I thought I got away with it, but because I came clean before the Lord and live a life that's in the light. Let me show you a scripture that's so important. Would you turn over to 1 John? 1 John, it's a beautiful scripture of agape relationship. And for, there's, it's just kind of in the beginning of 1 John there in chapter 1. It's so beautiful and so wonderful. In 1 John, in chapter 1, in verse 7, 1 John is way back in the back, the, the apostle of love. He says, that if we walk, notice, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And notice, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Isn't that so good? If you just walk in the light, be an honest person. Tell the truth. Uh, we were saying earlier, keep your commitments. Don't try to hide anything. Don't live a life that's hypocritical, wanting someone to think something about you when in reality you're very different. Yield yourself in an abiding relationship. Walk in the light. You go, Ed, what is walk in the light? Walk is a word in the New Testament, in the Bible, that speaks of a manner of your life, what you're known for. The idea of walking implies moving forward. So we're using this, this description of walking, moving forward as making progress. In the progress of your life, progress in the light. Well, notice what he says in, in, the script, in the verse just before it. He says if, in verse six, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and don't practice the truth. There's the choice that's laid before us. Walk in the light and receive the forgiveness and fellowship that's ours. We get to fellowship with one another and receive the cleansing of our lives and we don't have to have a guilty conscience, worry about being found out, but rather just walk in the light and just like there's nothing we can do to undo the past. The, the act is done. The difficulty's been done. The best thing to do is to come clean in repentance and humility. It's gonna be hard. There's going to be consequences. But I've learned over the years, and perhaps some of you can agree, that I'd much rather experience the consequences of obedience than the consequences of disobedience. Walk in the light. Don't walk in the darkness. Walk humbly in repentance. And notice, not only that, but notice in verse 9 of chapter 1 in 1 John, it's just so filled with treasure here. It says, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Can you just give God glory and praise for the forgiveness of your sins? Isn't it just awesome? It's so good. Let's try it again and be a little louder. Can't you give God some glory and praise for the forgiveness of your sins? He'll walk in the light. Why? Because your sin will find you out. And it's such a disastrous event. It always comes at the worst moment. It always comes in the most destructive way. I don't want you to mistake that God is chasing you down and trying to, to make life miserable for you. That's not true. He's made every provision for you to come out from under that sin that has been, setting, been besetting you or overcoming you just to come clean to know that you can walk in a way that God gives you the victory, that you can trust him with your life. I know the past is going to be condemning. It's going to try to condemn you. But remember, we learn in Romans chapter, one, in chapter 8 and verse 1 that there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ. You know, as we're driving 
uh, to church today or driving to work today or driving. You know, there, there, you were in a car, I was in a car or a truck, and it's always a good reminder to remember the ratio between the windshield and the rearview mirror. Your windshield is big because your cars are intended to be driven forward and you need a good frame of reference. The rearview mirror is small because it's just to be glanced at. You don't want to ignore what's around you or what's behind you, but you don't live in what's behind you. You move forward. That's how life is. You want to learn to have a big windshield of life so you can move forward. I know we have a past. We all do. And occasionally we have to look up at it or occasionally we're reminded of it or occasionally it comes. And then the enemy would want to use that against you, but there's no condemnation. You want to be able to keep things clean before the Lord. You want to honor him with your life and live in the thankfulness that he has washed me and he's cleansed my record and he's cleansed my past. Maybe the world won't cleanse my past, but the Lord does. And are there consequences from my past? Yes, there are. You can sit down and you go, man, this is the way it is. This is what happens. This is the price you pay. And I'm like, okay. If God wants to be gracious and merciful, great. If he doesn't, then I understand. I'm going to learn to trust him in this area of my life. But I'm not going to live there. And I don't want you to either. Because today, with that introduction in Genesis 43, Joseph's brother's sin is found out. Joseph's brother's sin is found out. He knows. And soon their dad will know too. Notice verse 1 of chapter 43. Now the famine, mark this word, was severe. Means it's getting worse in the land. And it came to pass when they had eaten up the grain that they had brought from Egypt, that their father said to them, go back and buy us a little food. But Judah spoke to him saying, the man solemnly warned us saying, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send our brother with us, we'll go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. And Israel said, verse 6, why did you deal so wrongfully with me as to tell the man whether you had another brother? But they said, the man asked us pointedly about ourselves and about our kindred, saying, is your father still alive? Have you another brother? And we told him according to these words, could we possibly have known what he would say? Bring your brother down. So Jacob, you know, as we're looking back, you want to harden your heart? You want to resist? And then allow the famine to become worse and more challenging. I'm going to let your grain disappear. Why? So that God might draw his attention to him again. What is it about us? Certainly we share this among us as believers, as just human beings. But what is it about us? When we have grain and we have resources, and we seem to have some semblance of control that we don't trust God. Like when things are lining up, I mean, let's say we have 10 things, but eight of them are, seem to be going the way we want. We just don't really seem to trust God in a deep level. We've been lulled into sleep by the things that we think we control. And so what does God do sometimes in our lives? He well. He lets things become, verse 1, severe. He allows things to become severe. And in verse 2, he allows things where the grain is gone and it's eaten up. He takes away, church, he takes away the things that we were trusting in. In just a moment of time, all our money's gone. It's just gone. Or our job, overnight, overnight. When we were left work on Friday and Monday, things have changed. It removes our health. What were routine, what is routine appointments, routine appointments, that last appointment, not so routine. Or even removes a person from our life. Maybe a relationship broken or an unfortunate, sad loss to death. And our immediate response is resistance. No, 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 no. No, this can't happen. What's going on here? No. And yet, over time, you learn, if you haven't learned already, the no's become less and less. And we find ourselves drawing closer to the Lord, trusting him. Our hands have to be empty, though. We can't be clinging to all these things that are giving us a false comfort. 
There's another kingdom coming. You see, you and I, we want to walk in the light as he is in the light. We have to remember that we're living for another kingdom. There's a kingdom that is to come, and yet we're living in the kingdom now. We are living under the authority of Christ. We need to remember that God is drawing us through those significant, severe losses in your life right now. Things were better when you had grain, and things were better when there was ready food, and things were good when it seemed like, but then all of a sudden, and I was reminded of Psalm 69 in verse 18, it says, draw near to my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of my enemies. I mean, but Jacob's still trying to control. He says in verse six, why'd you tell them you had another brother? If you just, if you wouldn't have told him you had another brother, then we wouldn't have to be worrying about this. Those are just words of control, by the way. Jacob doesn't come out and say, I'm trying to control this situation. Neither do you. <laughs> Neither do I. That's what's happening here. You know, if it was my way, things would be better. I wouldn't be so sad. I wouldn't be so depressed. I wouldn't be so fearful. I wouldn't be so anxious if I just had it my way. That's not true. The solution to anxiety and distress and contentment is abiding in Christ. It all comes from him. Remembering that it's his life now, not mine. For some of us, we have a testimony, don't we? when we had control of our lives. How'd that work for you? It brought you to Christ. <laughs> That's what it did. Through a lot of pain and suffering, it brought you to Christ. It brought you to the end of yourself. And you know, over time, those, comfort, those comforts and ease and things that are under our control, they come back again. And what does God do? He brings us to the end of ourselves. Jacob goes down fighting though. Certainly you do too. I do from time to time. He's brought to the point of helplessness. He has no other choice. He has to respond in faith. This isn't necessarily great faith in God, but he's going to have to trust the process. I want great faith in God. I don't always have great faith in God, but sometimes God uses that little faith to bring me to great faith. I just, I got to take the next step or I got to keep my commitments. I just, I don't know how it's going to work out, but however it's going to work out, God is going to be faithful. And that's where Jacob's all being worked out. Notice with me in verse eight, it says, then Judah said to Israel, his father, send the lad with me and we'll arise and go that we may live and not die. Both we and you and also our little ones. Judah, you know, his name means praise. Not an innocent man, but a beautiful name. He's just encouraging his dad. He's, God's going to take care of us. I'll take care of it. Verse 9, I myself will be surety for him. And from my hand, you can require him. If I don't bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear that blame forever. For if we had not lingered, surely by now we would have returned this second time. And the father Israel and you notice, remember I pointed out earlier in our studies in Genesis, you see Jacob and Israel being interchanged. And many times, not every time, but many times that interchange of his name is referring to the characteristic of how he's acting. Jacob, his name means heel catcher, manipulator, conniver. And Jacob, you see many times when he's referred to, that's exactly what he's doing. But now Judah, he appeals to Israel. Remember, Israel means governed by God, yielded to God. You could say obedient. He's, re, he's, he's appealing to dad in a way, encouraging him. Like, it's going to be okay. God is with us. So Israel, when he responds in verse 11, if it be so, then do this. Take some of the best fruits of the land in your vessels. Carry down a present for the man. A little balm, a little honey, spices and myrrh, sp sp <laughs> pistachio notes, nuts, <laughs> and almonds. Take double money in your hand. Take back the money uh, and take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps, perhaps it was an oversight. So Judah steps in. He, he takes the leadership, calms and comforts his dad. You can, I'll take responsibility and we're always grateful for those that will take responsibility, will step into a difficult situation. And then he Israel's kind of wrestling. We say, well, take some things for him, man. Take, take the best that we have. 
take the best that we have and double the money just in case and take back the money that uh, was put in the sacks. And I think that Jacob and Israel, his response here is very similar to how we would respond. I want my kids. I want to eat. I want peace. But Jacob's not there yet with I want God. I want the Lord. I want him. I want him like it was when I wrestled with him. I want it. He's not there yet. He'll get there. It's going to be a painful process. Verse 13. Take your brother also and arise and go back to the man. And listen, listen, now things are changing. And may God Almighty, this is the covenant name of God, may God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may release your other brother and Benjamin. If I'm bereaved, I am bereaved. I believe this sense of commitment's been on my heart because of this passage because of the prayer requests, some of the scriptures that I share with you, this sense of commitment, because this is the place of commitment Jacob comes to. He has, this is it. God has brought him to a place of commitment. He's brought him to the fork in a road, and he's got a choice. Walk in the light, walk in darkness. Trust or fear. Why? Because desperate times require desperate measures. This was, a mat- tri- this was a matter of life and death, not just Jacob's life, but his whole family and everybody that was with him. It was worth the risk. If we don't do this, we're going to die. You see, if the famine wouldn't have gotten worse, then probably they wouldn't have gone, ever gone back. And so what if Simeon's in jail? Don't forget where Simeon is. So what? we got other kids. We've already lost. Like That's part of the package. But God has a plan because it's more. You see, what God's working out in our lives right now is more than a full stomach. God has plans for the nation to bring forth Messiah. They don't know that. And even if they were told, you know how desperate times are. It's like, I'm not interested in Messiah. I'm not interested in Jesus returning. I just got a problem today. But no, the Lord wants you to be interested in Jesus returning. <laughs> Jesus wants you to look for his soon return. It brings purity and holiness in your life. And Jesus wants your stomach full too, but in the right order. You see, God's working these things out in us. As we'll see in this coming weekend, we've got all this stuff going on in the world. The epicenter, Pastor, Pastor Ed, for sure, has been sharing with you and sharing with you for 24 years. Keep your eyes on Jerusalem. Keep your eyes on Israel. That's where it's all going to go down. And then when things go down, people freak out. Like, what's happening? What's ha-? Well, it's happening exactly what the Bible said. Exactly what the Bible said. And what is the church's response? The church's response is to be salt and light. It's to be looking for the times and the seasons and understanding the pain and the suffering that comes because of other people's sin and to step into it. He wants us to understand prophecy, but not more than we understand him. He wants us to know the ins and outs to, you know, to some degree to study the word of God, but, but he never wants you to abandon the God of the word. Because <laughs> quite frankly, it's easier, isn't it? It's easier to have a full stomach than it is to call on the God Almighty and put it all in the line. Take my son, go ahead. It's much easier. It's much easier to be Bible students than to walk across the street and love your neighbor. Oh, love your neighbor. I know that scripture I love. And so when's the last time you loved your neighbor? Oh, no, I don't love neighbors. I just read it in the Bible. I watch some YouTube video and I'm going to love my neighbor. But what neighbor have you loved, church? Who have you shown mercy to and compassion? Who have you given your life to? Who have you helped in Jesus' name in tumultuous times? Who have you pointed to the hope of the cross of Jesus Christ in a time where the world is upside down? Oh, it's so much easier to be students of the word of God instead of submitted to the God of the word. And God is calling us more than full stomachs, church. He's calling us to himself, to a place of commitment, to a place of full commitment, to lay it on the line in our own lives, to see what God has for us. I remember, you can jot it down in Esther chapter. Let's look at it. Turn over to Esther chapter four. Esther chapter four. It's such a great time in Esther's life. 
Oh, that we might be encouraged. There are many, 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 many encouraging men uh, and women of the Bible. Esther, oh, it's such an encouragement. Turn over with me, if you would, just to allow the Holy Spirit to encourage your life through this beautiful picture of Esther. She is so encouraging to us, and she laid her life on the line. She got, came to the place of, you know, I, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. This is what God has called me to. Notice in uh, Esther chapter 4, when you get there, would you draw your attention to verse 10? Esther 4, verse 10. It's a short book. You can read it later for context, but Esther's been brought to this place where, notice it says, Esther spoke to Hathach and gave him a command for Mordecai, and this is what she said. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman that goes into the inner court uh, to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death. The one, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go in to the king these 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai told them to answer Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the king kingdom for such a time as this. And you say, thank God for the Mordecai's. Check this out, verse 15. Then Esther told him and returned this answer to Mordecai. Go gather all the Jews that are present in Shushan. Fast for me. Neither eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids will fast likewise. And so I will. Those are words of commitment. So I will go in to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. <laughs> Man, if I perish, what does Jacob say? Back in Genesis 43, what does Jacob say? I am bereaved. I am bereaved. This great words of Esther brings her to a place to step into a very dangerous situation. And this same, this same step of faith in Jacob's life, if I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved. I'm going to step out. And I'm going to take the consequences. Jacob, if I'm bereaved, I'm bereaved. I'm just going to have to commit it to the hands of the Lord. I can't do anything about it. It's out of my control. In church, it's important for us to come to that commitment where we rest in the providential care of God. God has been faithful. God is faithful. And God will be faithful in the things that concern your life and mine. Notice verse 15. So the men that took that, so the men took that present and Benjamin, and they took double money in their hand and rose and went down to Egypt, and they stood before Joseph. And then Joseph saw Benjamin with them, and he said to the steward of the house, Take these men to my home, slaughter an animal, and make ready, for these men will dine with me at noon. And the men did as Joseph ordered, and the men brought the men in Joseph's house, and the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house, and they said, it's because of the money which was returned in our sacks the first time we were brought in so that he may seek an occasion against us and fall upon us to take us as slaves with our donkeys. Optimists, <laughs> pessimists, realists, and men dealing with a guilty conscience. They can't see something good as anything other than bad. I mean, this is something that, although it, the dynamic of everything is very challenging, the king of the known world, or, or the second in command of the whole known world, has invited them to a party in his house, in his palace. I mean, that, that is an occasion for celebration. But they're afraid. They're not thinking of Joseph here, of course, and they're not thinking of the past. This is the cumulative difficulty that comes through years of trying to hide their sin. 
They have seemingly successively hid it from their dad temporarily. Temporarily here being me, just a mere years, you know, almost a dozen, 13 years. But they haven't hid it from themselves. And they haven't hid it from God. So he even hears something so good. This should be such an occasion. They think about they're going to they're gonna lose their donkeys. <laughs> and that's, that's where they're at. Let's go to a party. No, no, it's not a party. There's something here. Going to lose. No, no, no. No, no, there's not something here. You're the manipulators. You're the manipulators. Well, notice in verse 19, he says, when they drew near to the steward of Joseph's house, they talked with him at the door of the house and said, oh, sir, we indeed came down the first time to buy food. And it happened when we came in the encampment that we opened our sacks and, and there each man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight. So we had brought it back in our hand and we brought down other money in our hands to buy food. And we don't know who put our money in our sacks. But he said, peace be to you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. And then he brought Simeon out to them. So the men brought the men, so the man brought the men into Joseph's house, gave them water, and they washed their feet and gave their donkeys feed. This isn't his great words, peace I give. Just don't freak out, guys. This is a good thing. I know, I know, I know this leader. I know him. This is good. Don't be afraid. I mean, and notice this, if you see it in the New King James, uh, it says in verse 23, the, the steward there, your God and the God of your father. And they see the capital letters. I mean, he's talking about the one true God. He's talking about the almighty God that Jacob just mentioned. Here's this steward in Pharaoh's court telling the covenant children of God about their God. And isn't it just such an embarrassment at times where if you've ever, if this never happened to you, I'm grateful for that, but it's happened to me on more than one occasion where I'm rebuked by the behavior or the words of an unbeliever. At times it seems in my life I've noticed that uh, I've seen those that don't even believe in God have more confidence in a situation than I demonstrated in that moment. It really happened a lot at work with all the stress and things I faced when I was in the world. Like, man... And it's just the, the Lord just wanting to reveal to me, like, look at the faith in this guy, but you, he doesn't even know me. You do. And it's a, it's a mild rebuke here, which also tells me something about Joseph in the midst of his trial. It gives us insights and in, in even a more deep, careful study if we took forever, like a whole year to study the life of Joseph would people have, or a few years. It would give us a little bit insight that Joseph used his time in Egypt to talk about his God. This is the Joseph that went through everything you know he went through. Sold out by his brothers, sold into slavery, falsely accused of rape, thrown into prison, forgotten in prison. Remember that Joseph church? That's the Joseph that while he's in, in second in command and given authority over everything with the exception of few things, his steward is talking about his God. And whether Joseph told him specifically, as we would refer in the New Covenant, you know, in the New Testament, he witnessed to him or shared the gospel with them, whether he did something like that or he lived out his faith and, and the steward heard him pray and the steward watched him live and the steward seen him how he responded to things and knew like whatever happened, Joseph was a witness in the palace. And here's the steward pointing these Hebrews to their own God that they have forgotten and there are those situations in our lives that we think we're just, that are just miserable. We're like these, like the, the sons here, they come into a party and they think the worst. They're just miserable. This is it. It's over. He's inviting us to the house. He's going to take our donkeys and make us slaves. It's just the best of situation. But because of the condition of their heart and their attitude, they, they see it as the worst situation. And they see it as miserable. And yet, other people around us can see the same exact thing and just see all the good in it. Like, you don't understand how good you have it. 
You just don't understand how good you have it. You know, Christians, we, we have a tendency and a kind of a reputation to, to complain and, and to be faithless and fearless. And wh- whether it's true or not, it doesn't really matter. Our reputation sticks. And yet there are those that just look at our situation and it's like, man, you have it so good. Look at your life. And they don't even know the depth of it, of how good you have it in the spiritual realm, living without guilt and shame. You have it so good and yet there you are grumbling about it. So much so that the Bible instructs us not to complain and murmur and grumble about our situations. But we do. And it's not a sin that's confessed as often as it should be. It's not a sin that gets a lot of attention as often as it should be. Here we are with our eternity secure, experiencing intimacy and relationship with the almighty God, the creator of the universe. And we're grumbling about a flat tire or an old phone or an Android phone. That's good grumbling. That's fine. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) It's a sin that needs to be repented of, church. It could very well be holding you back from another step of faith in your life. You're grumbling about your current situation. You're complaining about where you are or where you're not. You're complaining about your situation And yet the Lord's calling you just to leave it here tonight. Just leave it here. Just give it to the Lord. Just cast your care upon him tonight and make a commitment. Not not some legalistic thing. I'm not asking you to make a commitment like you're just going to hold on to it and be like so like, but make a commitment to trust the Lord in that situation. Ask him to remind you of his faithfulness in the past, to encourage you in your present situation. So he bring you out into fruitfulness in the future. Ask him to take away a grumbling and complaining spirit. Like like just an atmosphere and an attitude where it's just never enough and it's never good enough. And it's just never this and never that. I mean, if you think about this, you think about the situation, even if it is miserable and even if it is hard and even if it is uh, just challenging, do you really think right now Do you really think that God has plans to make your life miserable? Do do you really believe he has schemes in his eternal uh, decrees and and his sovereignty and his providence? Like like the, the, the New Testament teaches the exact opposite. God is not thinking about how to make your life miserable. He's thinking about how much he loves you, how much he cares for you, how much he wants to see your marriage restored, how much he wants to heal you from your divorce, how much he wants to see your prodigals come home. His ways and his thoughts for you are good, not evil. Jesus died so that we might enjoy peace and freedom and tremendous abundant life. So like these guys they can enjoy a party in the palace, man. Because they're sitting there God, we don't deserve this. We're horrible, rotten people. And we just want to eat. Oh, you want to eat? You want grain? Yes, we just want grain. Oh, you want, you want grain? Well, I'm, I'm going to give you more than you can eat. Oh, and Simeon, come on out. Once not you see he's just fine? He's been eating pretty well. He, we've been well taken care of. Put your eyes on the Lord tonight. Take them off yourself. Get your eyes off the circumstances and fix them on Jesus. Because the ultimate commitment to make, isn't it, is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Well, notice in verse 24, brought him into their house, gave him water, washed their feet, Verse 25, then they made the present ready for Joseph's coming at noon, for they had heard that they would eat bread there. And Joseph came home. They brought him the present, which was in their hand to the house and bowed down before him to the earth. Then he asked them about their well-being and he said, and said, is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? And they answered, your servant, our father is in good health. He is still alive. And they bowed their heads down and prostrated themselves. And and this is interesting too. We don't have time to develop it, but it's interesting. The thing that Jacob was so concerned about, the sons ask, answering all of the questions, they're still doing. 
<laughs> they're, still, they're still so nervous. They're not thinking about dad right now. They're just nervous in the situation and they're still answering personal questions. They're still giving information. And I, I don't blame them. It's just interesting that Jacob was so concerned. It had to be an emotional moment. We're reading the Bible right now, but, but man, you have to put yourself, it had to be an emotional moment. I, I don't want to lose any more kids. I've already lost Joseph. I don't have Sam. I don't want to lose Benjamin. Like, what are you guys doing? What's your problem? You would think they would go, I don't think we should answer any questions about our personal life anymore. But they just go along, is your dad alive? Oh, he's alive. He's great. Everything's fine. And they're probably very nervous, very afraid, of course. And then notice, as they bowed their heads, it says in verse 28, and prostrated before them, he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, is this your younger brother of whom you spoke to me? He said, God be gracious to you, my son. Can't you hear those words? God be, that, that God be gracious to you, brother. And his heart yearned for his brother. And so Joseph, Joseph made haste and sought somewhere to weep. And he went into his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out and he restrained himself and said, serve the bread. So they set him a place by himself and them by themselves and the Egyptians who ate with them uh, by themselves because the Egyptians could not eat food with the Hebrews. It's an abomination to the Egyptians. And then check this out in verse 33. And he sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked in astonishment uh, at one another. Someone did the odds on this uh, for someone that didn't know them and to put them in order like this. Uh, and it would be one in 39,907,000 chance of this happening perfectly. So it, it is one with 39 mil, almost 40 million zeros after it for this to line up perfectly. For, and, and here's Joseph doing it. Why? Because he knows them. They don't know that, but Joseph knows that. And he took servings to them before them, but Benjamin's serving was five times as much as any of theirs. And they drank and were merry with him. A few thoughts before we head out. Their nerves are a little calmer now. They prepare to bless Joseph with the gifts and gives the present and gives information about uh, their dad, but they're not even quite accurate about their dad. He's not young, strong, and healthy. He's old, fearful, and terribly shaken by this whole situation. They're not even giving the full story. Dad is not as good as they presume him to be or present him to be. They bow down, which, by the way, again, it's been some time since we've been in our study in Genesis, but it's going back to the beginning. When they bow down to him, it sounds like a fulfillment of the dreams that got him in trouble to begin with. It's all coming to pass. Why? Because God's word will come to pass. And here they are. Sheaves bowing down to Joseph. He sees Benjamin, asks who he is. God bless you and overcome emotionally. He had to get alone. And I can, I can imagine it was just overwhelming how this is all coming to pass. I pray sometimes, it's hard, but I pray sometimes to feel the weight of the emotion in the text because this has just got to be unbelievable. So overwhelmingly challenging. And Joseph, as he sets them up, he puts them in order again. We listen to the odds of this happening if you didn't know the people putting them all in order. But what really stands out to me is that Benjamin gets a serving five times as much. Why? Well, if some suggested, and I tend to agree, that it could be that Joseph was testing them as a type of Christ. Not tempting them, but testing them, just revealing, allowing the hearts to be revealed, looking to see if there's still any kind of jealousy or bitterness among them with Benjamin. This could have been sort of a test to see if they were still the old guys they used to be, bitterly jealous of the younger brother who was obviously favored by the father. We don't know exactly what's happening here, but I can see that as being definitely a part of this, just like lining them up to see a revelation of their heart. Because the purposes of God will be challenging to be fulfilled through them as they are if they have a semblance of that old bitterness and that jealousy. And obviously at this point, it's not there. They seem to have passed the test. They drank and were merry with him. 
And it's a beautiful thing to watch how God will take these situations out of our lives. I mean, the, the men that we see here are just some of the most challenging sinful men in the Bible. These would be men that wouldn't fulfill the ministry qualifications of 1 Timothy 3. <laughs> so much of their life was disqualifying. And yet, God is going to use them despite them. Don't misunderstand. He doesn't bless sin and he doesn't bless mediocrity and he doesn't bless a disqualified life. But not everybody has a clean, perfect life. And today, it's important that you're reminded, no matter what you've been through and what you brought here today, what, how you're listening to me on the radio right now, that your life is preciable, precious, valuable, and usable in God's hands. You might be struggling with feelings of being inadequate or unusable, or maybe if I'm not around, nobody will notice. Maybe you think there's just one thing holding you back and you'll never get over it, or you'll never stop struggling, or you'll ne like you've got all these nevers in your life, but there's not one perfect woman or man in this room. Did you know that? God, he uses the imperfect. That's all he has to work with. God tied to take the imperfect and mold us into workable vessels for his honor. Listen, tie it all up with the introduction. You ready? You may be trying to hide your sin today because you believe that that's the way to be used by God. And I would say you are deceived. Can you come back with me to 1 John chapter 1? Come back with me. If that is your view today, where you think, well, you know, it's just something, that doesn't, it's over, it's in the past, it doesn't need to be dealt with, I can hide it. You are lying to yourself. You have bought a lie. Notice. Again, it says, verse five, this is the message which we heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cl cleanses us from all sin. And we skipped this verse, remember, because we went right to verse nine, but I want to bring you back and tie it all up in verse eight. If we say that we have no sin, in the context of this, is the root. If we say we, are, we don't have a sin nature, if we say we are sinless, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. However, there's an application here I want to share with you and it's this. If we say toward a particular sin in our lives that we did not sin, we hide, try to hide it, we have deceived ourselves. because our sin will find us out. And we don't want that in our lives. So much damage comes through the handling of the situation even more than the situation itself. So just come clean before the Lord today. Allow him to do a fresh work within you in these last days so that we can fulfill what God has called us to, to have fellowship with one another, walking in the light, demonstrating his agape love. Don't be just students of the word of God. Enjoy your relationship with the God of the word. So Father, I know that uh, these, you know, Joseph's, everything's coming to, to light and, and it's coming, coming soon where as they're brought to their knees, they're also brought to a place of worship so quickly. They're celebrating and partying and eating the best of the best. Why? Because of your great grace not because of anything we've done. And I pray for the many ways that you spoke to your church tonight, reminding us of your love for us and your gracious patience toward us. Even those that just are under the heavy weight of condemnation, it just seems to have derailed their lives, Lord. You're calling them back to a place of simple surrender to you, the place of full commitment, You've removed the grain. It's gone. The money, the job, the health, the person. So as in that you would allow that situation to draw us nearer 
Your word says if we humble ourselves before us, you will lift us up. So we just pray for a, a fresh anointing, Lord, a fresh outpouring, a fresh gift of humility and humble humility, like just to that place where we, you know, we yield to you. We declare our love to you. Even as we sing those songs, Lord, there's songs of love. It's all they are. How much we love you, how much we relish and glory in your love. How, how important you are to us. Even if, Lord, it's been like a season where you haven't been so important, Lord, we just come back to you today. We come back. We don't have to go the hard way. Go the easy way. And even if we have gone the hard way, Lord, it can end right now. I pray for the complaining or the grumbling that might just looking at our situations, like just like, oh, look at this, look at this. And yet you bring somebody in and go, man, you got it so good. And then what they see, Lord, it's because of your blessing, your care and concern for your kids. So God, we, we receive that outpouring to right now. We receive that affirmation tonight. We, Lord, we receive your forgiveness as we turn to you. And even churches, without calling for any kind of response or anything, I just, if you need to repent before the Lord, just do it right now during the song. Just pour your heart out to him. Open yourself up to the emotion of the reality of your situation. That it's not just mechanical. Like Joseph, you just got to get away and just weep. You just got to, man, Lord, what's going on? I can't believe. And you know, for Joseph, he's just weeping. I can't believe I see my brother. This is, I just, this is unbelievable how good you are to me, Lord. I can't even remember the prison. I can't even remember the pit. I can't even remember that. I, I don't even, that they aren't even in my, they're not up front anymore. They're, they're, they're wiped away and I'm just here with my family. My dad's still alive. I'm going to see my dad. And I don't know what God's working out in your life. It's not Joseph's life. You're not living Joseph's life. You're living your life. And God is ready. He's ready to reveal himself in a new way. So those of you, you know, Christians, you guys, part of the body of Christ here and the family here, you guys listening, you just repent during the song. Repent right now. Don't even wait. But there are some that need to repent of your sins for the first time and come to Jesus in surrender for the forgiveness of your sins like that like that's where relationship begins where you acknowledge who god is and you come to him and i want to give you i want to give that response i want to give you a chance to respond to the invitation of jesus christ he says come to me all you are weary and heavy laden and i'll give you rest and the only hope for your life is not a new government not the elections it's not more money in the bank the only hope in your life is the blood of jesus christ and he's ready to wash away your sins today. He's ready to bring you into relationship. And you are too. And for those that are ready, you'd say, Pastor, I want to follow Jesus with my life today. Would you just stand to your feet? I want to pray with you. I want you to respond to the work of God in this room today. The desire of God's heart is to bring you into relationship. And even I know relationship can scare you because there's been a lot of broken relationships with people, but it's not like that. God is the initiator. He is the commitment maker. Like I know saying today, like I've used the word commitment a lot and you just kind of have a history of breaking all your commitments. But in the Lord, he's the commitment maker. It's not you. You just respond. And so is there anyone among us today who'd say, Ed, I need my sins forgiven. I want to follow Jesus. I want to give you that chance because that's why we gather. We gather for the sake of response. Knowing that how much God loves you. And for you guys out online or uh, listening on the radio, God, we don't miss you either. Or you might be downstairs. We may not be able to see you, but we are firm and we know that God sees you. We know it. You're not alone. You're not forgotten. You're not neglected or avoided. But listen, you come to Jesus today, you can't stay separate. 
You need to be a part of a local healthy church beginning tonight. You need to find a church, preferably because of the family of churches we're a part of, find a Calvary Chapel in your neighborhood. But if there's not one close, there's really good Baptist churches, really good Foursquare churches, really good all, you know, Assembly of God churches. They're great churches. You need to be in one to be a part of the body of Christ, one that teaches the word of God. And so you could pray with me listening in from afar or even in the room here. You can pray with me. You can say, God, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. And I believe you sent Jesus Christ to die for me. And I commit my life to following him. I believe he's alive. And I turn away. I repent of my sins. And I'm asking God for your help to live a life in you and for you. And look, if you truly believe that God has forgiven you of your sins through Jesus Christ, you are born again. That's what the Bible says. You come to him, you repent of your sins. It's going to manifest. It's going to show uh, by your changed life. And we want to help you. So if you prayed in the room here, just come up after the service. The pastors will be up here. You have a, a little packet that we want to give you and connect with you. If you're online, you know, it's up on the website, How to Know God. Uh, if you're on the app, or you can just text us and we'll connect with you. 720-336-0897. But read ahead for our study uh, next time. Um, it won't be next week, church, uh, because we have our baptism next week. It's unbelievable. We have almost, I remember, were you guys out at the reservoir? How many people got baptized? We have another 50 people that want to be baptized and we still got another week of signups. It's unbelievable. The commitment level of what God is doing is so beautiful. So I think the number was 40 this morning. So we'll, we'll see way more uh, coming this week. And so just be praying. It'll be right here in the sanctuary. Uh, the heat will be turned on. Uh, we won't put too many ice cubes in the water. You'll be fine. It'll just be a glorious time of new life. And um, let's stand together. We'll sing this final song. And, you know, I know that baptism services are a little different. There's not a Bible study or anything. But look, you're here to encourage people. You're here to minister to people. You're here to, like, every time you see somebody baptized, you are seeing the gospel all over again. And you don't know. God's just going to encourage you. I can't believe it. I remember when I was baptized. I remember how bad it was. I remember the turning point. I remember the spirit poured out on me. I remember the vision that God gave me, like, You want to be an encouragement to others, but also you'll be encouraged. Uh, And so we'll have it all set up here and the brothers, okay? And Pastor Sean will be sharing a devotional with you and giving the gospel to those that are here. So it's a great opportunity to invite your family and friends to see you get water baptized uh, or watch a water baptism. It's just confounding to the world, you know? They just don't understand it. It's like, what are you guys doing? And you could say, we are identifying with Jesus Christ. He said, why do you do it? Because he told us to. That's our whole life. I do it because Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So that's next Wednesday. Uh, and then we'll pick up again back in um, Genesis next time, unless uh, the rapture takes place. Um, I know I'm over, but I've been gone so long as I have a lot of time to make up for. Uh, I do want to speak. You guys get it first. Um, We've got some connections in Israel right now. Uh, The one I'm working on right now is with our tour guide, Shraga. Our church is going to be purchasing um, uh, bulletproof vests for kids in the reserves. Uh, And I don't have all the details yet, so I'll try to get them by this weekend. Uh, But these kids, they have to buy their own stuff. And so some of them are going in without this equipment. Uh, And so I'll get more information this week. I'm working on it. Uh, We're going to be working with some Messianic congregations and sending relief and support uh, to make sure that families are taken care of uh, and and understand that the the reality of the situation is the care and concern for all of all of the above. Um, You know, there are Palestinian believers. You know that, you know, this is an opportunity for the gospel. uh, And our heart is uh, for Israel, God's chosen people. But our heart is also for anyone that's living and breathing. Uh, and so as, our, as we as a church, we're going to be involved in uh, relief and support to those that need the mercy and compassion and care the most. So I'll be working on that this week. 
Um, of course, we have our relationships in Israel, so we're, a lot of our support's gonna go through that. But I imagine uh, Calvary of Albuquerque is gonna be doing some stuff through Reload Love, and so we have a big relationship with them. So just be in prayer. Um, uh, I'll, I'll have some more information this weekend, uh, hopefully, and just know your church is already involved, even though it didn't get announced. You just know the Lord's taking care of it. And uh, if there's extra opportunities to give or a fund or anything, I'll let you know, okay? So God bless you guys. Have a great week in the Lord. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Church. For prayer, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. To listen to this message in its entirety or to join us for our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.